You're listening to She's the Business Podcast. What's something that you've done in your business that has made a significant shift for you in either how you run it, how efficient it is, or in your results? You've probably got something in mind that you're like, wow, that was actually so much more powerful than I ever expected, right? Well, today I'm bringing you the stories of three different people sharing what it has been for them, what their experience was, that has been those little factors that have made the biggest shift for them in their business. So stay tuned. You're going to absolutely love today's episode. Hi, I'm your host, Jessica Osborne. And in my 23 years of business and marketing, I've built many brands to become multi-billion dollar companies. And just in the last 10 years, I've built two online businesses of my own from my dining room table with two little babies running around at my feet. I've made it my mission to inspire you to get out of your own way and become the successful business owner who's living the lifestyle you really desire without all the hustle. This is She's the Business podcast, made by women for women. This is your weekly dose of motivation and inspiration. Okay, today you are not going to hear just from one very special guest, but I actually have three guests joining me today because this is a live panel that I actually recorded last year in 2022 with three of my Business Jam alumni. Now, I invited these successful business ladies to join me on a live panel to share what they'd been doing in their businesses that had led them to have greater success that were the real game changers for them in the previous year. Now, the reason why I love doing something like a panel like this is, for one, it's raw and real. This was not pre-organized. This wasn't scripted at all. They're just answering the questions as I ask them. We deep dive into, you know, what it was that they did. Even they share some of the challenges that they had, which is so powerful because for anyone listening, you can gain insights that lead you to greater realizations, breakthroughs, and definitely game-changing thoughts, ideas, Um, the inspiration that you might need to have one of these game-changing results for your business in 2023. So I thought that I would share this interview with you here on the podcast because it is absolutely fantastic. And the three ladies who have so generously shared their experiences and their success and failures with you have done that purely from the goodness of their hearts. So I thank them. Now you're hearing from the amazing Belinda Owen. She is really well known as a WordPress web designer and she also coaches other people on how to use WordPress. So, you know, how to take the scary out of it. Then we've got Hannah Page, who is an incredible speaker. She coaches people on how to be better presenters, how to be exciting and interesting and engaging as a presenter instead of boring, instead of the, those kind of ones that we want to avoid. And finally, Miranda Packer, she is a word expert. She's the founder of Wordbird Copywriting, and she's really great with brand voice strategies. So that's who you're going to hear from today. Um, three different women, all very successful, all experts in their area and just absolutely brilliant. So without further ado, let me play this interview for you. (laughs) So I'm really excited. This is the first time ever I've done a a live panel streamed on Facebook. So thank you, the three of you ladies for joining me for this. This is really exciting. I appreciate your time and being here. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, really cool. So for everybody who's um, tuning in to Watch us. Um, These three ladies are beautiful members of the Business Jam community, and they've kindly agreed, without knowing anything about this, to jump on live with me today and have a chat about, yeah, I guess their experiences, their business, share with you some of their insights and it's going to be a bit of a fun discussion. So as you can tell, it's not scripted. There is no plan here. We are all just (laughs) speaking off the cuff and having a bit of fun um, here on the page. So what I'd love is to start off with a little introduction um, to each of you, just to let us know, you know, what your business is, 
um, who you serve, uh, what you do at the moment. So who would like to go first? Everybody's quiet. Why don't you hit our first, um, Hannah? <laughs> Sure, I'll go first. No problem. I'm Hannah Michelotti. I am American. <laughs> I live in the United States. I live on the West Coast of the United States in Portland, Oregon, and I am a public speaking specialist and coach. I specifically work with women in corporate organizations who have to give presentations or they have to speak in public pretty regularly, and they're not advancing in their career because that's the block. They're nervous. They're anxious. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of it. And they're not seeing success when they actually do give presentations. So I specialize more specifically in helping people to tell actual personal stories and anecdotes in their presentations, because that's what stands out. And that's what makes you different from the facts and the figures that anyone else could present. Oh, so true. And it's like, how many times have you been to a boring presentation where somebody just stood up and, you know, went through slides with lots of bullet points and there was nothing memorable about it at all? Um, I really love that. And I think such a good skill, even for really anyone in business, you know, we're all presenting as soon as we get our face out in front of people, we are presenting ourselves and you want to be memorable, right? We want to be making that connection. So um, amazing. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, Miranda, would you like to share with us a bit about who you are in your business? Yeah, my, my name is Miranda Packer. My business is the Wordbird Copywriting. I'm a brand voice specialist. So I help women who are in a growth phase of their business to stand out with a distinguishable and you know consistent, unforgettable voice that's uniquely theirs and not like anyone else. It's the one thing in your business, you know, yourself that no one else can ever replicate. So I help people kind of connect with that, be comfortable with it and, you know, communicate who they really are through language that really feels like them. Love that. So powerful as well, because, you know, we, I think the more we are online and everybody's got content out there, it can just mm. start to feel so much the same, same, same thing. like everyone's sounding the same, it's looking the same. And when there's yeah. no vibe there there's nothing that's kind of making you feel like there's a personality and it's, yeah. it's unique and there's nothing to connect to then you just become wallpaper you know and I think no one really wants their brand to be wallpaper so um, <laughs> definitely that. not that's a great analogy <laughs> <laughs> awesome thank you Miranda and Belinda please introduce us to your business uh, hi everybody I'm Belinda Owen and I'm a WordPress website designer um my I guess specialty or niche is working with um, small business owners and startup business owners to get them on um, online. So to build their online presence when they're in the growth phase. And um, my, I guess my thing is to take the scary out of WordPress because I know when I first came into WordPress and I opened up the back end, I saw the, all these things and just was totally, yeah, blown away by it all. So my <laughs> thing is to make it less scary to help business owners take ownership of their website and to take back some control so that they know exactly what they're doing and how they can manage it so it doesn't become the scary big place that um, I know websites can become. Mm. Oh, yeah. like training as well. So I guess that sort of dovetails in with the wanting people to take ownership of their website. So I will teach you how to use it as well. So that's one of the things that I offer that maybe some don't. Yes, oh, definitely. I think, you know, having worked with WordPress websites for years and years, um, they can be so complicated, if, especially if you're adding in all those plugins and there's no end to the amount of different plugins that you can have, which I think is both wonderful, but also can be frightening because it can very quickly get out of control and you've got all this stuff going on. It's like, doesn't need to be that complicated. There's often a simpler way. Um, let's keep it manageable. Let's keep it really friendly. And actually the purpose of your website is that it's functional, right? We do, we want people to be able to find it, do what they want to do on it and, and make contact. So I love that. Very, very handy person to know, Belinda. <laughs> Taking the word, the scary out of WordPress. Awesome. So I, I guess like one of my first questions and I'm going to ask a question. I'd love you if you got an answer straight away, just dive in and answer it. Um, you know, you can say just let's just chat. But if I said to you, you know, what has changed for you over the past you know, year or so of your business? What is the one thing that comes to mind that's significantly changed for you? 
Um, for me, I would say that it's been um, a bit more focused. So the one thing that I've really got out of Business Jam is thin niching and not trying to be everything for everybody. And that's probably really helped with my messaging and being able to target who I want to um, who I want to work with, but who I can deliver the best outcome for as well. So that's mm. probably the biggest thing. I did I redid my website at the start of the year and I put all those sort of um, things into practice in my own website. So I really did try and target it a little bit more and, and had my ideal customer in mind when I was doing it. And it has increased my conversions. I think the website redesign also helped in that. And yeah, it um it's just yeah increased the conversions, but also I'm getting a lot more um, organic traffic coming through. Yeah, people um, completing forms who are actually in the realm that I yeah um, that I want to work with. So that's probably been the biggest thing for me. Um, and the group calls keeping people focused. So yeah, that's probably been the biggest changes. And um, yeah, there's been increases in revenue. So mm-hmm. I just did my tax. So from last year to this year, it's increased, which is always good. That's where you want to be going upwards. I mean, a sort of a bit of a tumultuous time for the world. It's yes. um, encouraging that, yeah, that it has mm-hmm. the workload has increased as well. So yeah, that's, um, that's my 12 months. That's brilliant. And I think as well, you know, we're, we're in a place where the market is getting crowded. You know, you know we're, everybody's talking about it. It's no kind of um, surprise because so much over the last few years with COVID, it's pushed so many people online. It's pushed a lot of people into working for themselves because the world out there just hasn't been working for us with our lifestyles. And so, you know, we're in that place where there is more competition, there are more people out there. And that's why it's even more important than ever that you are really clear and specific because people coming to your website, like you say, Belinda, you notice the, the change straight away when you went, got more clear and put that up on your website, the people arriving there, they're not just going, yeah, and bouncing back off back to Google search to yeah. see who else they're finding. They're like, oh, this actually sounds like this is the right one for me. And so they're taking that step forward. So, you know, it's like, it seems so simple and such a small thing, but really the results that you get out of it, like that's so powerful, isn't it? It's amazing. Good one. So what about um, you, Miranda or Hannah, who would like to let us know what's changed for you in your business? I'm happy to jump in. For me, it's um, overcoming psychological pricing blocks and, you know, not, not valuing myself, my work, my time, you know, what's different about how I approach my work, the experience I give, like, mm. just, you know, that one of the my favourite things that you ever <laughs> said to me was that I need to, well, it wasn't exactly like this, but it was I need to stop crowdsourcing my pricing. So you didn't say to stop to. I, what I talked about was that I'd been, you know, farming out how I should charge my work based on how other copywriters charge their work. And, you know, when you kind of put it to me that I was crowdsourcing my pricing, I'm like, that's exactly what I'm doing. And that actually makes no sense whatsoever because how other copywriters charge and how they work and the experience they give and the outcomes they deliver is not me. Like none of us are the same. And the irony is that the work that I do is around we're all different. We're not like everyone else. So why am I like looking to charge my work like everyone else? So you know, you really mm. helped me find the confidence to look at how I do things, you know, mm. the experience I give, the work that I put in. And I'm really, really big on research. Research is a huge part of the work that I do. And I know that the best copywriters in the world are massive on research. Like the really good ones are spending 80% of their time on research, mm. which is massive. And, yeah. you know, you have, <laughs> that comes at a cost, like at a fine, it actually costs a lot to pay yeah. someone to spend 80% of project time on research. Now I'm, I'm not there. I don't spend 80% of my time on it, but I spend a massive amount on it mm. and th- people have to pay for that because it actually yields a better outcome. Right? Yes, exactly. Great copy doesn't come from me just sitting here going, mm, I think I should write this. Like I'm spending time deeply getting to know their industry their audience their competitors and I do a lot of you know really direct research like one project I'm working on at the moment even just kind of testing out whether this brand voice guide is actually going to work for the people who are using it instead of just creating this beautiful guide and then hoping the people that use it can actually use it part of the work will be testing it and I know that not everyone does that and you know that's I'm now really comfortable charging for that work because I know that the value is actually there. 
Yes, absolutely. And it ties into exactly what your promise is, that your brand mm. is going to be your voice and unique mm. and, it, and for it to be powerful and work, then it does have to be using the right language for mm-hmm. that particular company and their audience. And you can't do that unless you've done the research because you're not going to know what the right words are to use or how yeah. to speak in the way that is right for that business. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, and you can think, well, there so many people can be a good writer. And I know from, you know, all those years back in the day, you, mm. you kind of would just, people would just write in their style and they go, I'm writing for this business and I'm going to write your copy, but I'm applying my my writing style to it. So it's like yeah. you end up with all these businesses you've worked for all, you know, in your style, your voice. It's like, no, we actually, when we're writing for a business, we've mm. got to write for their voice, don't we? So yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really amazing. And, you know, I think on that whole crowdsourcing, the pricing thing, it's like the other copywriters, they were not your clients. So getting the other copywriters' opinions on what you should be Mm. charging, it's like they're not even the ones who are going to be buying this. So their opinion really means absolutely zip. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) They, they, um, Mm. you know, that, and it was amazing. So tell us what happened when you decided not to crowdsource (laughs) your pricing anymore. (laughs) Um, What happened then? Yeah. So um, I just want to say to you, it is helpful in the early days, like when you're new and you really don't know what to charge, I think it's okay to actually go out and go, what's everyone else doing? Like if you really don't know, but the difference with me was that I actually knew and I'd been doing this for a while and I knew what I should be charging, but I was actually doubting myself and therefore going looking for Mm. validation through crowdsourcing my pricing going, what's everyone else doing? (laughs) Um, So yeah, to answer your question, what changed is that I stopped second guessing what I knew I should be charging. I stopped going, oh, maybe people won't actually pay that. Maybe I'll like just dial it back a little bit so that it kind of feels better. And I I stopped doing that immediately. And on the first project where I was just, that was quite a big one. It was the biggest one that I'd ever sort of quoted on. Instead of going, "Mm, I need to dial it back a bit because it's really big. I just went, no, that's what it's, that's what it's actually worth. That's what it's going to cost. And the client said, yes. And there were no questions asked. And I was, (laughs) and it just reinforced that. Yeah. I didn't need to second guess my pricing. I didn't need to, you know, drop it back. I didn't need to crowdsource it. I needed to, it was okay for me to charge what I knew I should be charging and I would still get the work. Amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. So powerful because it's that time then you're actually being paid, you know, we'll call it properly, um, mm. what you should be being paid for the work that you're doing. And it's still great value. You know, they're yeah. getting so much value out of that, far more than what they're paying for it. And it just means that you can then be, you know, in your business working the hours that you want to work, but being Mm -hmm. paid more in those hours, which then leads to you being like, it's okay that I'm working part-time and I'm having time off with the kids Mm -hmm. and I'm doing all of these other things because you can say no to some of the other work that's not as well paid um, or the stuff that doesn't light you up. Exactly. And And it also mm -hmm. means that it then kind of puts you in a place where you can afford to bring on other people to support you in your business, Mm -hmm. which then means that you have more time, more energy, more focus to spend on the work that people are actually paying you to do. You're not burning yourself out doing all the other things that are not in your zone of genius. Yes. Yes. Which is, you know, really important in terms of the work that you're delivering to clients. Like, you know, if I'm spending time doing project management and emails and admin and, you know, all the stuff that I actually don't want to be doing, if I have to do that, then it's taking me away from the work that I really want to be doing. And it's probably going to affect the outcome as well. So the end result mm-hmm. is actually just better for clients. Yeah, exactly. And like, you think, I guess it's that shift as well from it being, this is a business it's like a job and I'm doing it to make money or to earn money to it Mm. being like, this is actually my life. And Mm. I want to spend my hours doing what I really enjoy. And yes, I want to be paid for it. You know, that's all part of it, but it's not a job that you've created for yourself. This is a business. And when you're, you know, in your zone where you're, you know, working at your highest level, doing what you really love Mm. and enjoy, what a better use of your time than just taking on a project that will, yes, it, someone will pay you money for it but it's not really what you want to be doing there's such a subtle shift in that that kind of seems like oh really what's the difference at first but when you look at it it's enormous because it is is enormous and Mm. the other thing that happens when you undercharge is that you kind of start to you may not resent the job but you don't you like if it is (laughs) 
taking, you know, longer than what you feel like you're kind of getting paid for and you're putting in nights and weekends to kind of get it done and you're like, well, I should have actually charged a lot more for this and the end result is I'm really not getting paid that well. You can't love that job as much as when you know you feel like you're actually getting paid your worth. Yeah. And so do you really have, you know, is it always your best work when you're feeling Mm. like I haven't charged enough for it and you're kind of mindful of the time that you're putting in? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just human nature, right? We always want to do a good job yeah. and we want to do our best, That's but right. you are, in the back of yeah. your mind, it's that niggling thought yeah. like, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm really not being paid for this. And That's right, yeah. There is and a, I think, you know, yeah, some people will kind of shy away from saying that, but the reality is that if you're actually, if you don't feel like you're getting paid your worth, then it is hard to love the work that you're doing. The other side of it with um, undercharging and that sort of thing is you find that you have to take on more jobs to meet your commitments and because exactly. everyone's got goals you've got monthly commitments that you have yep. to and in order to meet that you might end up having to take on more work which then yeah is burnout and you end up working way longer than you want to and mm. you find that the quality of work for all your clients drops exactly. because you're trying to fit in so much work that you physically really can't fit in so yeah you sort of it mm. might rush it or or work too much and yeah you like me like I used to be working at midnight just trying to get things done and I looked back and went I can't keep doing this like the hourly rate that I'm getting paid is dropping down to like $30 an hour or something like mm. that I thought I should I could be going and working at Coles for four hours a night and be done with yeah. it <laughs> so, that's um, exactly right yeah. so yeah. that's for me that was the other um thing that and I think yeah if you also helped with this Jess because I did bring this up I think it's probably at the start of the year when I was sort of going you know what I'm yeah, I'm not meeting my monthly commitments, but I'm working so much. What's the problem here? And yeah, it's sort of down to what you charge. And with the skill level that I've got now, like I think I could have charged that back eight years ago when I first started, but now I've got so much skill and knowledge and I'm giving that back to my clients that they're benefiting a lot. So it's not even about the hourly rate anymore. It's about what you're giving mm. them back. Mm. So the the knowledge and the the outcome, mm. as Miranda said, it's, it's the outcome that you're giving your client. And I'm giving them a website that's not just one that they've built themselves or it's not just a Wix website or anything like that. It's a website that is built properly that they can then take and grow with. So it's got the good base and the good bones. So it's not one that needs to be rebuilt in two years' time. Yes. That's what I'm giving them is, is a saving of having to spend another three grand in two years' time rebuilding something that just wasn't done properly. Yeah. Start. So. Mm. Um, yeah, I probably had to had to look at that, and it hasn't dropped off who's um, accepting jobs. It's um, yeah, it hasn't affected that, which you you tend to think it does. You think oh, people just want to pay thousand dollars, but yeah, it's um, mm. it's not the not the case. People want to they want to get value for money, so and a good outcome in the end. Mm. So I think that yeah, we have to get out of that mindset, and it's really hard to do, especially when you're starting a business and you're trying to make ends meet. You think that you have to cut costs in order to meet your commitments, but it um mm-hmm. it that way. <laughs> yeah, it's for a short term, but it's not a long term solution. You, you may be able to do it for a month to meet that the goals for that month, mm. but it's not a long term solution. So it's not a good business plan, <laughs> I guess. It's, yeah. Exactly. And that's such a common fear as well that, oh, if I raise my prices, people won't buy, therefore I have no clients Mm. and my business will, you know, Mm -hmm. it'll disappear. And Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it's something very real. I think we've all been there before. We've all had that thought and feeling. And the reality is when we move away from thinking about it, like uh, the price and really focusing on the hourly rate or, or that and actually move to, well, what is it that I'm delivering? What is the value? What are they getting from it? Like you just said, Belinda, it's not about how many hours you spend building the website. It's actually about the quality of the website they're getting you know that you've built in there that it's not something it's a basket case that they're going to have to get re redesigned in a year's time when they realize that it's not functioning properly you know you've got it seo optimized like there's so much value in there in what you've done because you've got that experience because you're bringing all that experience into the project yeah. It would take them 10 times longer to do the same thing themselves if they wanted to go on yeah. YouTube and Google all the how-tos and figure yeah, exactly. it out. Exactly. They could, right? But, you know, or they could pay you to do it and you know all of the, the catch holes of, like to avoid and all the things that you need yes. to, to do. So. Anyone can, can build a website, but it's whether, yeah, as you said, you've got the time to sit there and Google and, and look up things and research and and whether you've got the time to, I guess, put 
everything into it that needs to be needs to be put into it and then as you said the, the know-how like I've seen so many mistakes happen and even I've made the mistakes I look at a, the first website I ever did and I'm like oh my goodness like you can just see <laughs> the mistakes now so that's I guess what people are also paying for they're paying for your eight years of, of mistakes and and successes um yeah mm -hmm. but they're avoiding that so they're avoiding eight years of the things that you don't know that you don't know because <laughs> right. you, don't, you know. don't know how to google something that you don't know right <laughs> you can't google, you can't google, yeah what's the best seo plugin if you don't know that you need an seo plugin it, yeah. Yeah, it's, that's it so everyone sticks to their zone of genius i think and um yeah it's as you said it's about what you what you deliver in the end so yeah I don't think you could up your price if you've been in business for five minutes and you're still mm. learning your craft I don't mm. think that you can be charging a hundred dollars an hour as a web designer if that's the case and yeah certainly wasn't at that point in time but I think that once you've developed your craft and then um mm. built an expertise then you can charge for the expertise that you've built absolutely yeah. Do you have anything to add to this, Hannah? You've been sitting there nodding along. Price really wasn't something for me that I needed to work on, especially yeah. um, my field. I know we're not supposed to necessarily look at our competitors, but for public speaking, there's a good amount of money to be made. And I knew pretty early on exactly what I wanted to charge as a starting rate. And I also am very aware that I don't want to be the most expensive person in my field because I'm trying to access people that aren't in the C-suite. I'm trying to mm -hmm. access people that want to get to the C-suite. And in yes. order to be accessible, I have to have accessible pricing. Mm -hmm. And that's part of my model is I want people to be able to afford me, but also be able to make money and make a living. So pricing was never a block for me, but I 100% agree. They're paying for your mm -hmm. years of experience. They're paying for the mm -hmm. mistakes that you've made. Mm -hmm. They're paying for what you know. They're not just paying yeah. for the service that you're delivering them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you just like touched on something really important there is that your pricing is aligned to who it is that you're trying to attract. Mm -hmm. And it's that alignment that mm -hmm. makes it work. It's not about where am I in the market? I'm going to pitch myself against all of the other players out there. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's kind of irrelevant what everyone else is doing <laughs> because they're not your clients, right? They're not the people who you're attracting. It's about you setting the rates for who you're trying to attract. And we, you know, can see so often where we're out of alignment, maybe your price can be too low sometimes. So the people you really want are thinking, well, oh, that's probably not the quality that I'm looking for. They're going for someone higher. Um, or, you know, maybe if it's too high, again, it, it's not going to work as well because you're pitching something at a level that they're never going to be able to, to do. So it's really important to, like you say, be that clear on who it is that you're marketing to, who it is that you want to attract. Your service offering then is aligned to it. And like Belinda said as well, this alignment piece goes into your lifestyle as well, right? Because if that service offering isn't going to if it's going to keep you working until midnight and that's not what you have an intention for in your life, then how long do you really think you can be doing that business for before you completely just give it up, like, or lie on the floor in tears or whatever is going to go on, right? You just, it's not going to work for you, um, which means it's not going to work for your clients either. So that kind of alignment piece, getting all those bits in place. So it's like this service offering works for me in my time and my bit, you know, what I want to be doing in my life. It works for the revenue and income I want to earn. It works for the clients I want to attract, like all of those pieces align together and Hey, it works. You get the life, you get the clients, you get the income, you get all of the things because you've done the work to, to adjust it into um, alignment. Which... And it made a really good point about um, pricing for your audience as well. So yes, I, I do that too, because I'm in small business and startups. I know that they don't have an endless bucket to spend on a website, but I know that they still want a quality website, but yes, they're not going to be paying $500 for one either. So um, yes, it is about pricing for your audience as well as pricing for your worth, as well as pricing for your experience and what you deliver. And yes, you're right. It's a big package. So you can't compare yourself to somebody else because their target audience could be different. So I can look up another web designer in Brisbane and find that they're charging $6,000 for an e-commerce site and go, wow, I'm undercharging. But their, their business model could be completely different to me or they could be targeting bigger business. Huge stores, you know, like imagine an e-commerce site for an enormous store that's got thousands of products. Oh, you know, it's totally different. Right. To, like my yeah. products aren't paying $5,000 for a website. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you wouldn't want to work on it. <laughs> Not a website you want. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, yeah, it's about as you said, the whole, the whole picture, the whole package. Yeah. Amazing. So Hannah, tell us what it is that's changed for you over the last year or so. What has been that 
thing in your business came to mind? Well, kind of in this uh, pricing groove, one thing that really has connected with me is this idea that I set the hours that I want to work to live the lifestyle that I want. And I'm a big believer in a four day work week. We are not built to work five days a week, eight hours, Mm -hmm. 12 hours a day. That's just not how humans are built. Mm -hmm. And that all started in the early 1900s. And actually it came to fruition and it started to go global with Henry Ford. He wanted more people in the factory. He wanted more people making cars. And that's when he instituted the five day work week, eight hours a day. We as humans right now, we work more than peasants used to in the middle ages. They had more vacation time. They had more lunch time. They had more dinner time. They had more family time. And to me, that is absolutely absurd, especially with technology and everything that can do so much for us. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I specifically made sure that I do a four day work week. And that doesn't mean that I don't work on Fridays. Like maybe I do some admin stuff or stuff for me, but I'm really active outside my business. Like I do trail running and mountain climbing and Um, just alpinism in general. And so you kind of have to be gone for three days in the summer, almost every weekend in the summer to make that happen. And that's almost a selling point for my clients. They're like, I work with this really great public speaking coach, but she's also really rad outside of work. She likes to go climb really high into the mountains where there's no (laughs) oxygen. So it's kind of a selling point on that end. So I've really tried to institute that. I do not see clients on Fridays. It's just a firm. I'm not available because also seeing a client at four o'clock on a Friday, their brain is absolute mush. That's not going to be a great call for them. That's not going to be a great call for me. They're not going to take anything away from that. They're not going to do their homework ahead of time. I don't think you should have meetings in corporate environments afternoon on Fridays. Like, I think it's ridiculous. We're not at our best. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've done that. And then the other thing that really clicked for me is instead of spending a lot of my social media time on Instagram or TikTok or Pinterest or what have you, my audience is on LinkedIn. They are in the corporate environment. They are corporate professionals. So where do they show up? They show up on LinkedIn. So I bit the bullet and I was like, I'm going to make LinkedIn my bitch. And (laughs) I am still working on it, but, and it's still hard because I think the platform is absolutely terrible. It's a lot of like patting each other's backs. Like, congratulations, (laughs) Ingrid. You were promoted. Yeah. It's just disgusting. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to have a different take and be someone different on LinkedIn and have success with that. And I've learned a ton actually. And one thing I'll share is that with LinkedIn, it's not a like ride or die kind of a post. So on Instagram and TikTok, you have to make a killing within the first however many hours that you post something. Mm. On LinkedIn, it stays fresh mm. for weeks. Mm. I'm mm. still getting impressions and hits on these posts that I put up weeks ago. And that pleases me greatly because the pressure to just make an instant killing with an Instagram post or something on TikTok, it's too yeah. much. And I don't want to live like that. So LinkedIn mm. has kind of, it's, I'm coming around. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you like, you said it because it's exactly what we all think. I, you know, you go on there and I think that's one of my pet peeves about LinkedIn. It's like people just be humans, you know, <laughs> you know, mm. don't have to get on there and, and try to like show everybody how smart or intelligent you are. And, you know, it's just, oh, it is. It's just really it's, fake, I think, because how people behave and interact on LinkedIn is not like if you took them out of LinkedIn and put them in a room, <laughs> would they behave and converse in the same way? No, they wouldn't. So just stop no. it. congratulations on your latest promotion high five it's just stupid the other thing that they do is they put up these strange personal sob story posts that have zero connection to their business or zero connection Mm. to their work Mm -hmm. and they don't they don't go anywhere and it's like well what what was the point of that on the platform because I'm Mm. I'm trying to drum up business and you're trying to tell me about how you had an emergency room visit that's great I'd probably just share that with my family and friends in an email (laughs) <laughs> or on my personal Facebook page, maybe, if you if you want to put it on social media, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah, you kind of can see, I mean, there's so much that's out there. And I think that they're like, oh, I've got to be, be personal and share something vulnerable. So oh, I've got a story, I'll share it. But it's like, we're forgetting to actually link and provide any context like mm. why are we sharing it and how mm. is it actually relevant <laughs> to anything <laughs> else that you want to think about me so it's like you know sharing there's nothing wrong with sharing a personal story but like mm. but, creating yeah, make the it really and that make, make it meaningful otherwise you're just sharing a random story and people are like mm. okay 
well done. <laughs> Not yeah. sure what I meant to think about that yeah. because you haven't it's told me. <laughs> There's different platforms for different stories and different pictures as well. So mm. your platform, you said Facebook, it's probably a little bit more like that. You can probably post mm. something like that and no one's going to look twice. But, yeah, LinkedIn, as you said, is definitely you would think more of a professional space. So it's about networking with other businesses and, and that sort of thing, not, as you said, your emergency room visit or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> Broken leg or something. <laughs> Amazing. So I guess I wanted to ask you now um, to give us a bit of an insight into what the reason why you joined Business Jam in the first place and what you maybe thought you were going to get. And then, um, you know, what has been your biggest, what's your, been your experience or what's been the thing that you thought, well, this was actually what I expected or maybe not what I expected, but good or um, keen to hear your thoughts. So who has, sorry, that was a very roundabout question, I think, because I've had two cups of coffee. This yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can answer that straight away because I know exactly why I joined it. For me, it was about niching. It was, I was doing all the things for all the people and total generalist. And I knew that was not what I wanted to be doing, not what I needed to be doing, not sustainable but I just knew I needed someone to hold my hand through the process of how do I niche? How do I decide? How do I stick with it? And um, like, so for me, joining Business Jam and having you kind of guide me through the decision-making process and then bouncing back when I decided the niche that I chose wasn't actually where I wanted to be was, you know, probably one of the best things to come out of it for me. Because if I didn't have you helping me every time I kind of explored something, I'd be like, oh, I have to stick with this because I've decided that's what I want to do. <laughs> and then I'd be really uncomfortable and I wouldn't be aligned to the work that I was doing. So having the fortnightly check-ins to kind of just talk about where things were going and then go, oh my gosh, this isn't working. I need to do something different. And, you know, just having you kind of talk me down off the ledge when I felt like I'd maybe <laughs> made a poor decision and was second guessing whether I should be changing my niche or not was super valuable. And it kind of, it got me to the place where I'm now actually really comfortable with the, the niche that I've chosen for myself. And I, I don't really know where I would be or what I'd be doing or whether I'd still be up on the ledge if I haven't, didn't have you holding my hand and kind of guiding me through that whole process. So that was really valuable. Me. Oh wow! Thank you, Miranda. That's awesome. It was a pleasure too, and it didn't seem like you were on the ledge, to be honest. <laughs> it, it did in here, and that's it. Maybe didn't to you because you did such a great job of getting me down off the ledge. <laughs> it's okay. We can change our minds. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about finding that right groove. Awesome. Yeah. For me, it was so I was one of the founding people, I think, or in there at the start. Mm -hmm. um, so it was sort of more just a an opportunity to join a, a group and to get help um, when I needed it most. So I was probably still, yeah, really building and defining my business at that point in time. And mm -hmm. I guess like Miranda, completely lost. Um, I was trying to be all the things for everybody because I was putting so much pressure on myself to meet monthly targets. So I didn't really have the opportunity. I didn't have a second job that I was doing while doing this one. So I didn't have a fallback um, income mm -hmm. coming in. So what I brought in is what I brought in. So there was a lot of pressure to meet those goals and I was trying to cast the net wide to try and catch more fish, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but then, yeah, learnt quickly that that's not the way to go about it, even though you think it might be because I was probably attracting some of the wrong sort of customers as well. So I did get um, this, a big e-commerce store under management and it, um, yeah, it wasn't a good fit at all for, for either of us, but I found that I was putting in so much work and effort on this one client that I was neglecting other clients who had been clients for a lot longer. And um, it just, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't working that business model that I had, but also taking on such a complex site under a management plan as well. So I did sort of um, pull back and targeting service-based businesses now because that's where I really find that being a service-based business myself I can offer the most advice and the most guidance and that sort of thing so I still take on a couple of e-commerce stores and I've got some really wonderful e-commerce clients but my niche is service-based businesses so mm. um, it was able to yeah I was able to sort of narrow that down and now I've sort of found that um create working with creatives or virtual assistants um some tradies so I've got a few tradie clients as well 
those sort of and health sector. So I've um, got a couple of chiropractors and physios in there. So I think that, yeah, targeting those kind of niches has actually really helped because then I've been able to um, really build skills in those areas. So um, I can really target what I'm um, delivering as well. So delivering a better outcome. Um, yeah. So that was probably the biggest thing and the support. So being able to jump into a group and ask a question or jump on a call and just, even if you don't say anything yourself, you're listening to everybody else's. And I get so much advice from listening to other people's questions and then the advice that you give them because I'm like, oh, yeah, that would probably do that too. So I got <laughs> it down on a piece of paper and um, in my little notebook that's growing with things to do. But, yeah, so that's the, that's the biggest thing. I think just having the, the support and somewhere to go, like Miranda said, somewhere to just say, oh, my goodness, I'm completely dying here. Can you, you know? Tap talking mm. down off the ledge yes yeah. like definitely and as you know Jess I've had the last probably 12 18 months some real troublesome times so yeah to have that support and to know it's there has probably been um, one of the biggest things because having your own business is lonely um, especially as a sole trader when you work from home there's there's no one else around you it's just an online world and mm. it can be lonely if you if you make it lonely if you block yourself out so you really need to build connections with select people not everyone because then you can spread yourself too thin so I was in lots mm. and lots of groups and I was finding that I was getting information overload um so I've actually just cut down to sort of three or four people who are aligned with my business model and I feel giving the information that I need so yeah I've tied it down to four and I'm still in business jam because I yeah totally valuable so, yeah, we don't want to use our social media networks as our therapist. Do we? No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't social media. Not that this is a therapy group, but you know, it's like a safe place to come in there and chat and actually, yeah, not get random advice from you. Random. It's not a hundred people who your problems. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. What about you, Hannah? Yeah, for me, when I joined Business Jam, I had done, I had taken a class, a community college class, and what I discovered was that I had a really big hole in marketing, and I mean this in the least pompous way possible, and I think everyone can understand, I'm pretty good at what I do, I'm really good at what I do, I think we're all really good at what we do as business owners, and I have people tell me that, and it's not just my husband and my mom. I have clients <laughs> tell me that. And so I was really frustrated because I was like, well, if I'm really good at what I do, why aren't more people hiring me? Why do I feel like I'm on a hamster wheel trying to source and trying to find clients? It was, it was infuriating. So I figured it was a marketing problem and I did some deep diving and it was a marketing problem. So I found Business Jam and interestingly enough, what I took away from Business Jam, I will never forget, were the three concentric circles. So Jess has it in one of the modules where one is your industry. That's the biggest circle. And then the next circle inside of that is the work that you do in the industry that you like. And then the smallest circle within those is your specialty and what you are known for. So yes, you can do all the large things, but you are known for that one tiny little thing that you do. And that, for whatever reason, was like a light bulb went off. I was like, oh, I want to be known for helping people with storytelling, actually telling personal stories in presentations in your stinking LinkedIn posts so they have a real connection to other <laughs> human beings and can actually sell. I want to be known for that. I want to help people with that because I know storytelling is powerful. I've done it my entire career. I spent 10 years in corporate America. I do it in my personal life and I do it in my work. And that's what I want to be known for. And Jess was like, people will come to you for public speaking in general, for nerves, for anxiety, for fears, but you want to be known for something. And I always thought that was closing all the doors of opportunity. And instead, it's actually keeping them really open. And you're just, people just know you for this one thing. It's like being a car mechanic for a very specific niche type of car. You're going to have everybody who has that car coming to you. And you're also going to have the Volkswagen and the Porsche clients who are like, hey, this chick, she knows what she's doing under the hood. Get her mm -hmm. over there. She happens to specialize in Aston Martins, but she also knows Porsche and VW. So that was the biggest takeaway for me was that I actually needed to get even more narrow instead of casting this giant net. I called myself a communication consultant. What the fuck does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> And no one knew what that means. So clients were coming to me, you know, that's a problem. So now I'm very specific. Like I do stories and storytelling and I've created a service around it. Yeah. 
Ah, so powerful. And just like listening to you talk about that then, that is why you do it because you're so passionate about it. Your energy, you mm. you just, you cannot help but to deliver that with so much power and passion. And we're all hanging on your words because you really care about it. You really love it. And it's what you do best. Whereas when you're like, yeah, I help you with presentations, you kind of be like, well, it's, yeah, it's like, okay, what is that? But you're like, I help them with storytelling so that they get their LinkedIn posts and it's not boring nonsense mm -hmm. that they're writing. Yeah. What a difference, right? And you can just see that example just in how you're talking. And so imagine that when you're going from that sort of vagueness and, you know, you know what it is in your head, but no one else really knows or gets what it is that you're doing to being so clear and specific and delivering a message and, you know, having opinions and like, yeah, I'm going to say that because I can, because I'm an expert in that area. Well, guess what? People sit up and they pay attention and they like, I need her because she knows what she's doing. <laughs> so I love that. That's the biggest thing I think that you get out of, out of niching. You then be able to, you, you can then target your message and you find what you're passionate about. And that was, yeah, that was the thing that I, I found as well. Same as sort of Hannah, that I want to help people with WordPress. I don't want them to think that it's this great, big, scary place. And I see so many posts of people on, you know, online who hate their websites and I can't do anything mm. in it and I hate it and it's a mess and it's, yeah, it's just horrible. And I think it should, doesn't have to be that, that way. It, you can take ownership of it and it's not, this, it has, doesn't have to be a scary place. And if I can teach myself WordPress and all that sort of thing, then so can you. It's not, it's not that hard to learn once you know it. And that was, yeah, that was the biggest thing that I was sort of thought, right, I want to niche down to be able to help people with their websites and give extra information. A lot of people hold information close to their chest because they think they, you know, people, they want to keep sending mm. people back to them. And I sort of think, no, I'm I'm here to give you information. I'm here to help you. I'm here to tell you how to do something. I'll send you a Loom video on how to do something on your website just in an email that you've sent me asking a question because that's what I want to do. I don't want to, you know, hold your website to ransom and I don't, yeah, that was sort of the biggest thing as well that I thought, right, I want to be able to make sure that people can take ownership of it and I know that startups don't have the money to outsource everything on their website so if they can change a phone number or change an image or update some text themselves then that's saving them a hundred dollars by them being able to spend the 10 minutes mm. to do that because they know how to do it and they don't have to sit on google asking google how to do it so mm. that's probably the biggest thing that yeah just understanding your customer so I understand that as when I started business I didn't have a hundred dollars spare to spend it on somebody else I was trying to do everything myself and I know small business owners when they're not at the outsourcing stage yet are in that stage. So yeah, it's about understanding your client and when you niche and you actually realize who your target audience is, you can talk to them and say, Hey, I was you. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is what I'm here to help you with because I know exactly where you feel or what you're going through. So that's, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing with niching. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's exactly it. And I was just thinking as you're talking, it kind of takes away that whole thing of like, oh, I'm not the world's expert on this topic. Well, you don't need to be. You actually, you're there for who you're there to help. And in their eyes, you are the expert, you know, and you absolutely are. It doesn't mean that you've got to be the biggest expert in the whole world to be providing that value. And Belinda, you know, you I remember having conversations with you where you were like, oh, but there's all these developers and people who, you know, got all these skills and what do I really know? And I was like, but your audience, they don't know how to speak and developer speak. So they want someone who can actually talk to them in plain English and tell them it's actually not that hard. Let's just talk about this in a simple way. And I'll show you the things we don't need to make it complicated. And that's, that's the such biggest. a difference that you were able to step into that role and be like, okay, I'm here to help these people. And I know exactly how to do that. I know how to talk to them. because that's the biggest thing. And that's where imposter syndrome comes in. Because yeah, I was in you know, developer groups and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, these people are so smart. <laughs> What they're doing with their websites but then you're right I then had to pull back because I thought well my customer doesn't need to know that either like my customer doesn't need to know how to code something in a site so they need to know how to install a plugin 
it, and mm-hmm. yeah, that's the difference. It's about mm-hmm. yeah, targeting. That's what I created my Facebook group. So yes, that was exactly the idea of my Facebook group was you can ask a question of how do I install a plugin or how do I back up my website? Questions that you're not going to get smashed for because I know if you go into a developer group and ask that question, they're going to be, what are you even doing on WordPress? So <laughs> you're going to get completely, <laughs> completely hammered by smarty pants people. So that was the idea of creating a Facebook group that you can ask that question and it's a totally mm. different question. Mm. As you said, you wouldn't be asking it if you knew the answer. So there's no such thing <laughs> as a dumb question. That's Yeah, that was sort of what I wanted to build that yeah break down that barrier yeah love it so if you could go back and give your past self a tip uh, Miranda what do you what would be a tip that you would give yourself to just install that little bit of insight be able to help you to move forward faster than than what you did if you want to move forward faster or if you think actually it all happened at the time it was meant to happen which yeah. it can be as well but yeah, I, I guess yeah it did, but I think it would just be to to back myself, you know, to back myself, to believe in myself and to, you know, trust my instincts and, you know, trust that I know myself and the work that I deliver and what feels right. Like I just, mm. I wasn't backing myself just in kind of talking about, you know, what drives us and, you know, and niching and, you know, our own stories. I only made the connection just quite recently about why I feel so passionate about brand voice. I hadn't, I like, I knew that I was, but I hadn't really realized why. Hmm. And like, I kind of had a story from my early days of copywriting that it wasn't that. I've realized that through a lot of my life, and this is probably more at a subconscious level than a conscious level, I felt forgettable. And you know, the way that's hmm. manifested is, you know, you meet people and then you meet them again and they have no idea who you are. And that's actually happened to me quite a lot and maybe it's the same as everyone else I don't know but you know inside it's felt to me like I've always been forgettable and it's I only realized recently because again you know I was someone who I've met countless times still had no idea who I am and I just went you know and I started to think about you know my messaging and about you know being unforgettable in business that when you stand out and you own your voice and unique you, you cannot be forgettable and I was like maybe that's what what's really driving me that's what I'm so passionate about is because for, you know, as kids, and like I know as a child, I was taught to kind of like blend in, don't stand out, don't be different, mm-hmm. just be safe, be like everyone else. And then, you know, through adult life, I felt like I was constantly just, you know, not standing out, being forgotten. And so when I first launched my business, I went with very bland, very vanilla kind of content on my website, sent it to a marketing friend and she tore it to shreds, which was great. It was the best thing she could have done. <laughs> She was like, this is not you at all. Like this doesn't, this just sounds like everyone else. I'm not excited by it. I don't feel like I want to work with you. Go back and change it. And she wasn't (laughs) as brutal as that with her language, but that was the messaging behind what she said. Yeah. But I, the whole reason I sent it to her is because I knew she'd be honest. I wanted her to be honest. I didn't want her to just go, oh, it's lovely. Yeah, it's great. Cause that's not helpful if it doesn't help me attract the kind of people I want to work with. And so I went back And interestingly, I did have a lot of personality in it to start with. I paired it all back and went, yeah, yeah, that's kind of the same as what everyone else is doing now. That feels safe. And so then when I kind of went back to what a lot of it was beforehand and put a lot of myself into it, she's like, wow, I love it. This is great. This really feels like you. And I feel like I want to work with you now. And, you know, kind of realized like the people that I love spending time with are the people where... I know that they know the real me and they value me for me. And the reason why, you know, we're great friends is because they love certain things about me that are different. The people that you don't really enjoy spending that much time with, you know, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily being yourself. You're not putting hundred percent of yourself into mm. conversations and experiences. You have so much more fun when you really are being yourself. Yes. And if I can help people in business do that, through the way that they communicate, then I'm going to have fun. They're going to have more fun. They're going to attract more of the people they kind of want to work with. (sighs) Language is a great way to attract the people you want to work with and repel the ones that you don't. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) There's a copyright friend of mine who's like headline on his side is stop boring the shit out of people. (laughs) And he does that because he knows immediately that if someone goes, oh, 
then that he doesn't want to work with them. And that's a great way to filter out those people. Mm. It's only going to attract the kind of people that he wants to work with. And I love that. Yeah. And mm. like you're so right. It's kind of like, what are we all holding back from mm. saying? Like, oh, I've got a real, I've got an opinion on this. And it's like simmering away. But we're like, oh, but if I say it, I know a lot of people won't like it or people won't mm. agree with me. It's like, say it because that is you. That's what you believe in. It's going to attract the people who do resonate with yeah. you. And yes, it's going to repel people, but that's a great thing. And mm. it's something that I realized, um, you know, I've been talking to lots of people who are, you know, quite um, spiritual in the energy space lately. And I was like, oh, I finally really realized what this means, you know, 24 years into marketing. I'm like, to att attracting is an energy. And that means that there's always a force that is the opposite because that energetic force can't exist without one that's going the other direction. Like that's just how the world works, yin and yang. Like there's always the counterbalance, right? It's like, so you have to repel. If you want to attract, you have to repel. You, there is no attracting <laughs> without repelling. Um, you know, they both coexist at the same time. And so if you're not repelling, then you're also not attracting. <laughs> you're like, you're sitting there in no man's land. And the more you're attracting, that also means that you're repelling. Like the guy who said, stop borrowing the shit out of me. I love that. Because yeah. that was just, you know, it's punchy. It's like, boom, mm. mic drop. I love that. But, you know, it's mm. so powerful, isn't it? Because you straight away are like, pay attention. Wow, I'm really mm. sitting up now. So that is amazing. I totally resonate with that, Miranda. It's like, how can you be memorable, not forgettable? How can you like really cut through the noise? And there's so much noise out there. <laughs> like, oh my God, go onto any platform. And I don't know, like that's the kind of thing, I guess for me, I'm always like, well, whatever everyone's doing, I kind of want to do not that. I want to yeah. do something that's different. You know, if mm. everyone's following trending audio or songs on TikTok, mm. guess what I'm not doing? Mm. That because exactly. everyone's doing it. I don't want to be a cookie cutter. I don't want to be mm. the same as them. I want to, you know, I might do a TikTok video with no music at all and just I'll just talk at you and it'll seem really weird <laughs> so people might stop and listen <laughs> you know yeah. I'm like I just want to try to be different and mm. no, you know but not always just tr being different for different sake like being different to be me yeah. like this is what I believe in that's yeah. really cool love that well I have my I think aren't on TikTok I couldn't do that <laughs> 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 I've just been experimenting on it like I'm literally usually it's something you know I decide if I'm doing something I'm going to go all in and do it properly with TikTok I'm like I'm not 100% convinced so I'm calling uh, dabbling as in I'm paying not much attention to it and I'm not giving myself any rules that I've got to live by I'm just going just going to see what happens mm -hmm. if I post this kind of thing what happens like do people mm -hmm. watch it do they not like it's kind of like I'm being a bit of a scientist experimenting and I'm not <laughs> taking it too seriously, <laughs> um, which is all good because, yeah, like we all know, you know, I think it's one of you said before, oh, Hannah, you were like, you know, you being everywhere. You were like on on Instagram and you were doing all of the things and you're like, no, I'm just going to own my space on LinkedIn. And it's like, we don't have to be everywhere. We don't need all the platforms. And it's really good to know what your main one is. Like you should always have one main one. It's like, you want to find me, come mm. here. And yeah, people might find you on other ones, but mm. you know that you've got your energy, you know, what you're putting into, you're putting into that one because that's where your people really are. Um, so it's, you know, it's really good to hear that because I think, we can make our life so complicated and with trying to do all of the things that different people say we need to do and all these different methods, mm. oh, it's exhausting. <laughs> it's like, that's not really aligned to what we want in our business, right? We want it to feel fun and we want it to feel mm. like this is something I want to do, not just because another person's told me that I have to. Yeah, it's something I think I believe in really strongly. So hopefully, mm. you know, people come into business channel like, I'm not going to tell you you've got to post on Instagram five times a day or even be on Instagram if you don't want to be. Like, great, you know, be where you want to be. Be, you know, let's let's choose your activities so that you've got something that is aligned to you and it feels good for you. Um, but it's also, you know, I guess strategically, you've got some stuff happening in the right places so that you have got a stream of people finding you and, and connecting but yeah. yeah I'm very big on no cookie cutters we're like <laughs> These are your audience is as Hannah like joined LinkedIn and yeah that's where her audience is and you just gotta yeah be where your audience is master the one platform mm -hmm. maybe even and or just yeah. the two and yeah mm, yeah 
you're spreading yourself thin again and it's like it comes back so like the niching like once you start to be in too many places you just you're spreading out so then you're just a quarter into everything if you're in five so or is that four i don't know <laughs> that's four <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. that's four so yeah you're on four platforms you're a quarter in so it's yeah managing them becomes hard and I find that too. like I just yeah I'm on Facebook at the moment I have an Instagram account but unless someone posts there for me it's it's really hard to jump on and manage so yeah I'm just sort of Facebook at the moment but um I think I need to be in Pinterest I think that's something I have to look into because I've heard that's that probably where creatives live so I probably should be there but um that's maybe next year's job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can share, you know, I think it's all about being strategic, isn't it? So it's like, you know, as a web designer, you've got something really visual to share for your business. So Pinterest, I think, is really great for visual stuff because people are looking at things and pinning them to a board. Whereas, you know, like, yes, you can be on it. It's just like I can be anywhere, right? There's a lot of different places that we can be. Um, you know, for my business, it wouldn't be as strategic to be on Pinterest. Um, you know, it's, mm. I think it really needs to be like, what is the purpose of being on it? Um, you know, how is that really helping the business? And then seeing with the numbers, you know, what is happening? Am I getting what I thought I was going to get from Pinterest? Mm. So like, you know, try it out if you think that that's going to be the thing. But um yeah, yeah, I'm always really conscious. We can always keep adding to the business, but some, you actually need to also cut off. <laughs> so add, assess, and then like drop the stuff that's not um, not working unless you mm. need it and you need to optimize it. <laughs> Amazing. The other thing well, I've done with social media is I I do it across all platforms. I think, Jess, it could have been you. It could have been someone else. They were like, if you put it on Instagram, put it on YouTube, put it in your email, yeah. put it on LinkedIn, don't make something new. Just use the same content on every single platform. That was like mind blowing. I was like, but the email list, they'll know. And they're like, oh, well, they know. You put it on LinkedIn and you've emailed it to them. There's nothing wrong with that. That has saved me so much time. Yeah. And it's also worked as a really nice experiment. So I now actually have a YouTube, I'm a slow building YouTube presence and LinkedIn simply because if I had a video that I made on Instagram, I put it on YouTube, I put it on Instagram, I put it on LinkedIn and I send it in an email. Easiest thing, three platforms done. Yes. Yeah. Repurposing content for, for sure. It's all about working smarter, right? You know, you put that effort into doing one thing rather than chopping up that time and trying to do three or four different things that aren't probably going to be as good or as powerful. And like we all know, you know, repetition, consistency, like people hearing a message, you can hear it more than one time because they might not have really paid attention the first time and this or the second time or the third time you can say it again, like you can repurpose your good content even over time as well, because it, it, it's not that it's not relevant anymore, you know, share stuff that's relevant and we don't need to make life so hard. Um, you know, I think brand new. There's so much in that where we kind of held, hold ourselves to ideals and things that we think we need, but really like what's going to help that person that's out there today who you wanting to help? What, what could you share that might help them or that might resonate with them? And it's okay if it's something you've shared in the past, because guess what? That's, you know, the purpose of sharing it today. That old post is probably lost in the feed and you can share it again. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's a really good tip, Hannah. Um, well, if does you any does anybody have a <laughs> have a final tip or anything that you'd like to share today? Um, because yeah, I've been loving this conversation so much. We've covered, I think it's been really inspiring. So let me know if you've got a final um one liner you can drop your tip or takeaway and then we will wrap it up. My only tip would just be like, for me, it was, it was an absolute no brainer. Like I've always said, it's the best decision that I've made since I started my business. And I stand by that because it's changed so much for me in a really great way. Um, and I can't even say that if I could go back in time, I would have joined it, you know, faster or sooner, because I think pretty much as soon as I came across it, I expressed interest. Um, you even made time to have a quick phone call with me, which was great. I loved that. And I just immediately got a sense that this was going to be a great decision and it's proven to be everything that I thought it would be and more like, you know, I wholeheartedly stand by it and really do believe that this has been a game changer for me, which, you know, it's kind of obvious, but I do, you know, very much recommend Business Jam as being great 
for anyone who's perhaps looking to you know do any of the things overcome any of the problems that we've talked about today and so much more wow thank you that's amazing thanks Miranda second to Miranda's um, comments there that yeah it's definitely a no-brainer um and I think the the one other thing that maybe we haven't touched on fully is when you have the the group calls that you're also then building networks with mm -hmm. other fields so um you can ask questions about other things so you can learn so yeah if there's a lawyer in the group like you've got Tracy um in there and mm. then you've got Miranda copywriter like Hannah speaker like you've got a variety of people in the group so that opens up extra doors for you for networking and all that sort of thing mm. as well so that's probably something else that you you don't expect to get but you do um and that that mm. connection yeah yeah I agree that's been really really mm -hmm. valuable and the group size is really nice too like you've got a great you know a great mix of people with different you know complementary sort of skill sets and it's not you know it's not an overwhelming group size you're not kind of getting lost there's not heaps of conversation to try and keep up with which can be the case sometimes in bigger groups so it's you know it's certainly been you know one of my favorite groups to be a part of I love that I love the group calls I just think you know mm -hmm. so amazing to get on zoom mm. even though we're not in mm. the same room but we will do that one day <laughs> yeah. um, and have a, a you know and actually have these conversations and you know it's there's just something about it isn't there like the the energy of the different people in the room and how much that you learn and grow um from just having those conversations about what's going on and and you know working through those barriers that sometimes we don't even realize are a barrier that's yeah that's, that uncovering yeah. And I think even just like the kind of people that you attract to Jess, like there's a there's a similar energy, you know, across people. Like I was in another program, like very very different, and it was much bigger. And the Zoom calls, like sometimes they would just drive me crazy because there were people in there who I would just not choose to spend time around if I had the choice. And so part of that time on those calls, I'm like, do I really want to be spending my time on this call? I never felt like that for even a minute on Business Jam. Like every minute on every call is always valuable and enjoyable. Yeah, I love my people. <laughs> you guys are all amazing. <laughs> so we love hanging out. <laughs> I think for me, one of the things I really enjoy were the some of the modules because I'm really big on self-knowledge and um, personal knowledge and the more you know about yourself the more you're able to put together your business and the kind of people that you want to attract because you know who you are and what you want which is a really big part of running the work that you do and yeah. a lot of the modules I kind of treated them like journal prompts and so I would just write about what you know me 365 days from now looks like what she thinks what she feels how she's doing in her business and that was really powerful and I, I still have those notes and I'll go back through them so I think there's a lot of value too outside of the group calls in the modules and having access to them and really treating them kind of as like a journaling space or a way to learn yourself better because the more you know about yourself the better you're going to be in business like I love what Miranda said that you know you can put together a vanilla script about yourself but that's not going to attract the people that you want when you actually put out the real you with specificity and intricacies and opinions and this is your ride or die on the line that's what draws people to you and I think you learn that through journaling and through some of those modules and those prompts which I found really valuable yeah oh that's so good I know it's kind of um one of those things you don't really expect do you but when you start diving in you learn a lot about yourself and it helps you in your marketing. It helps you know how to speak and, and what you need in your business and actually even what you're designing for your business. Like, well, uh, you know, going through that same process myself because I walk the same talk, like this is all what I've done in my business too. And um, yeah, really realizing, well, why would I do that when that's not really me? And this is where I shine. This is what I want to do and, and be. It makes a difference and we can make all those adjustments and then we, you know, you're living your best life I guess in a cheesy cliched way <laughs> don't really know how else to say it <laughs> we'll bring out the cliche <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much, um, ladies, for joining us on this panel. This has been heaps of fun. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. And um, if anyone listening has a question, you can always drop us a note in the comments um, that we can respond and answer any questions that you might have. But I hope you've enjoyed hanging out with us because it's been lots of fun. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Such a pleasure as always, Jess. Do you know something? There are so many people that are overcomplicating their marketing, which means that they're running on the marketing treadmill, pumping out so much content, but still not yielding those results, meaning there are no clients actually signing up. Like what use is an audience if they're not an audience of buyers? What use is it creating great content to share if the people who are reading it have no desire to take that next step to actually working with you? Well, if any of those things are happening for you right now, then it's highly likely that you're simply missing a key in your marketing strategy. And those keys are really simple. There are just five of them. And it's about how you align them, put them together. That is the simplicity that makes everything work, just like clockwork, so that you have a consistent stream of what you would consider your dream clients, literally turning up in your inbox, ready to have a conversation, ready to sign up with you without you going out there to find them. So let's put an end to cold outreach. Let's put an end to searching for clients in Facebook groups. Let's put an end to just waiting around and relying on referrals to come through from other people. Because when you have that consistent stream of clients, then you're in the place of being able to choose. You've got an abundance of opportunity out there. And all we need to do is turn on the tap for your clients to find you. So I've created a brand new training and it's called Five Keys to Clients on Tap. So you can guess what it's about, can't you? Well, this one hour short training takes you through those five critical keys that you need to have in your business so that you do have clients on tap and not just any old client, the ones that you most want to be working with that are going to make you profitable, that are going to fulfill you, are going to make you feel like jumping out of bed every morning because you love your business so much. So you want in? All you need to do is head to jessicaosborne.com slash TMF for the magnetic formula. So TMF and get yourself into the next session that's running for this training. You honestly will not regret it. It is going to change your business, your life, if you've been experiencing any of those problems I mentioned before. Look forward to seeing you in there and let's do this.